A while back, I made a video about the eight most influential ideas in statistics. Towards the end of that video, I briefly mentioned another article that they cited as covering a similar topic. It was called The Importance of Being Clustered. I originally included it in the video just as a nice detail, but honestly, I couldn't get the paper out of my head. I kept thinking, how would you even use statistics to analyze itself? So, one day, while I was doing some research, I decided to read it. Not only does it give us a look at the major topics in statistics, but it also somehow models how these topics have evolved over time. Furthermore, I discovered it was actually a pretty cool case study for a novel statistical analysis designed for the special problems in the data. So in this video, I'm going to teach you how this paper uses statistics to learn about statistics. If you're new to the channel, my name's Christian, and I'm a PhD student in biostatistics. The goal of this channel is to make statistics easier to understand so that others can better apply it in their daily lives. My main focus right now is explainer videos, but sometimes I just get obsessed with the topic and just need to make a video about it. Let's get started. A lot has happened in statistics since Pearson established the first journal for the field, so much so that it's hard to appreciate just how far the field has progressed. Maya Angelou once said that we won't know where we're going if we don't know where we've been. This paper tries to describe what this would mean in the context of statistics. It was originally published in 2019 in the Journal of Statistical Science by three professors from the University of Bologna in Italy. Instead of just being a general essay about broad topics, this paper actually uses a novel analysis to study the history of statistics. And this is no easy feat. Statistical research is diverse, and there are too many subtopics and nuances to count. How can someone hope to use statistics to uncover its own main ideas? Furthermore, what kind of data would you even use to answer this question? Thankfully, we don't have to figure that out. The paper already has all the answers. Good statistics starts with the question, not the model. To be explicit, the paper attempts to answer the following questions. 1. What are the leading topics in statistics? And 2. How have these topics changed over time? To answer these questions, the authors gather data. So let's have a look at the data first. The authors gather data from five of the most prestigious journals in statistics. Biometrica, the Journal of the American Statistical Association, or JASA, the Annals of Statistics, the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, Series B, and Statistical Science. They gathered all the manuscripts from these journals published between 1970 and 2015. To publish in these journals is to publish something meaningful to the field of statistics. So it's a perfect source for understanding what it was focused on on a given time point. In total, they gathered 15,472 articles. But like many statisticians before them, no one has time to read all of those articles. Instead, the authors only used the titles and abstracts of these articles. So they dealt with text data in the end. And if you've ever dealt with text data before, you would know that it's almost as much fun as pulling your own teeth out. Instead of dealing with the text itself, the authors examined the number of times that different words appear in the document. By doing this for all documents, they construct what's called a document term matrix. A row in this matrix represents data from a single research manuscript, while the columns represent the different words that appear in this manuscript. Therefore, a single cell in this matrix represents the number of time a given word appears in a given document, but different manuscripts can have different lengths for their titles and abstracts. To make the numbers in this cell more comparable, the authors normalize the counts using the inverse document frequency. We don't need to worry about the specific definition here. The whole point of doing this is to make sure that the numbers are comparable by controlling for the number of documents and their links. Furthermore, the authors don't use all possible words in the documents, they remove common words and words that are too rare to contribute meaningfully to the analysis. One thing that's notable about this type of data is that it's inherently sparse. Over 99% of the cells in the document term matrix are zero, and the sparseness represents a major obstacle to the analysis. In response to this particular problem in the data, the authors construct a novel statistical model to account for it. This is where I think statistics and biostatistics research is at its best, where the data motivates a more nuanced analysis. This is not the same as collecting data and applying different statistical models just to find the one that lets us say that the p-value is less than 5%. Stop it. Get some help. That's p-hacking. Don't do that. The authors recognize that the model that they use should account for the particular details of the data so that we can learn more from it. Let's examine the model they use to analyze it. 
By formatting the data this way, the authors hope to be able to better organize documents into topics. Intuitively, if two documents have similar proportions of the same words, then we might be able to say they come from the same topic. But there's a lot of words to consider, so the authors use a very specific notion of distance to summarize all of this information into one number. Given two documents and their inverse document frequencies, the cosine distance between them is given by this equation. This is not a distance in the everyday sense of the term, which is usually Euclidean distance. Distance in this sense refers to a single number that describes how different two things are. When distance is zero between two things, we interpret these two items as being the same thing. As you can see in the numerator, this distance gets smaller when both of the documents have a frequency in the same column. If one document contains a term but the other doesn't, this mismatch doesn't contribute to reducing the distance between the documents. The denominator makes sure that this entire term only ranges between 0 and 1. And finally, we subtract this term from 1 to make sure that 0 indicates sameness. You might ask yourself, why would we use cosine distance as opposed to other definitions of distance? And the reason is sparseness. The sparseness can distort how different two documents are if we use other notions of distance. But cosine distance is resistant to this. But distance doesn't tell us anything about specific topics. To use a more statistical language, the authors imagined the topics as clusters. So documents in the same cluster cover the same main topic. I think it's important to mention that the authors assume that all documents only have a single topic. While this probably isn't the case, this assumption was made to encourage the clusters to represent general topics rather than specific subtopics. Even if documents are part of the same cluster, they may cover different aspects of that main topic. And here's a key insight. If we focus on a single topic and pick a document at random from this topic, we won't be able to predict how relevant a document is to that topic. That is, there's a certain degree of randomness within a topic. To capture this idea, the authors model the idea of a single topic using a probability density function, or PDF, which we'll show here. This is called model-based clustering. This probability distribution is not based on the actual documents themselves, but with distances. A single topic has what's called a centroid, indicated by this Greek letter C, which could be interpreted as the most representative paper of that topic. So, when we enter this theoretical most representative paper into the equation, the distance is zero, and we're left with this function. The purpose of this function is to make sure that the entire function integrates to 100% which is a requirement for a function to be a PDF. If we enter a document that's similar to the centroid, then the value of this PDF remains higher. If we use an unrelated document, the distance will increase, which decreases the value of the PDF by extension. This lambda here is what the authors call a precision parameter. This controls how fast the probability density decreases as documents get farther from the centroid. High lambda means that even small differences between the documents will greatly decrease the value of the PDF, and vice versa for low lambda values. Another way to view this parameter is that high lambda values encourage clusters to be more homogeneous. This PDF represents a single topic, but there are many possible topics in the entire field of statistics. So, to represent multiple topics, the authors use what's called a mixture distribution, represented by this equation. In this case, it's a mixture of these cosine distance-based densities. There are k of them here, representing k different topics. Each PDF in this mixture has its own centroid, and another term indicated by this pi underscore i. This pi i is what's called a mixture weight, which represents the proportion of documents that are a member of this topic. Notice that the lambda doesn't have an i index, so this means that all clusters share the same lambda value. I think this is a modeling choice made by the authors, and it enforces the idea that all clusters should have the same degree of homogeneity. So this is the model that the authors use to represent the different topics in statistics. A mixture distribution itself is still a probability density function, but just more complex than what I've talked about on the channel so far. With this model, they need to estimate a few things. They need to estimate what the mixing weights are, what lambda is, and more importantly, what these centroids are. To do this, we can form what's called a likelihood, which is just a product of all the PDFs for all the different observations. If the parameters of this model are estimated well, then the value of this likelihood should be maximized. But it's easier said than done. If you look at this model carefully, do you notice that there's anything missing? 
We've talked a lot about topics and clustering, but where in this model are the actual topic memberships? We don't actually know what they are, so we can't use them in the likelihood. Not only do we have a sparseness problem, there's also a missing data problem. But thanks to innovations in algorithms and computing, we can still estimate the model parameters despite this missing data problem. Specifically, the authors employ the EM algorithm to fill these missing cluster memberships and get the parameters that maximize our likelihood. I won't go into the gory technical details, but for the hardcore among them, you can find them in the original paper. In the end, the authors chose to go with 25 clusters to represent the leading topics and statistics. Not only do they get the top 25 topics among all the journals together, they also look up the top topics within the journals themselves. But for this video, we'll only examine the overall results. I'm not going to waste your time and just read off the list of 25 topics. Instead, I'll show you this nice table they made and work from my own visuals. The authors sort this table by a number called the Cohesion Index. The Cohesion Index gives us a rough measure of how homogeneous the group is overall. A higher Cohesion Index means that the average distance to the topic centroid is lower. By far, the largest and most cohesive group are the hypothesis testing papers. And this makes a lot of sense. Hypothesis testing is one of the major ways that statisticians make decisions about data. And to be clear, these papers are not on basic topics like the t-test. These hypothesis tests are in the context of complex data. These papers enable us to make decisions about these new types of data. The next biggest group is regression models. Regression models are one of the major tools that statisticians use because they are models that help us describe relationships between two variables. Most people may be familiar with linear or logistic regression, and these are often people's first introduction into these types of models. And you would think that I would know what the third biggest group is, but I actually have never really heard about graphical models. It's kind of crazy to think that I've been studying biostatistics for five years, and there's still a large group of topics I've never really heard of. This table gives us a pretty good snapshot of what you might study in graduate school for statistics or biostatistics, since many of the so-called classical topics are represented on the table. That includes hypothesis testing and regression models like I mentioned, but also maximum likelihood, asymptotic properties and confidence intervals. And then there's more specialized topics like survival analysis, causal inference, and design of experiments. I would say that the table is pretty representative of the various research topics and statistics. I know the basic lay of the land, but it's still cool to see that I still have a lot to learn and that I can use this table to look up these topics when I want to learn them. If you're interested in learning more specific details about each of these topics, section 4.3 describes them in some detail. This paper was actually published two years before the famous list created by Andrew Gellman and Aki Vitari. One of the main reasons I wanted to read this paper was because I wanted to know how topics selected by a statistical analysis compare to a more curated list. Just going off of the lists alone, this analysis captures three of the items from the Gelman Vitari list. Bootstrap, general computation algorithms, and causal inference. These topics are large enough to merit being one of the paper's 25 leading groups. The other topics from the Gelman Vitari list, even though important, I assume weren't large enough to be in their own group. The authors themselves note that some popular research areas, such as robust estimation, do not have their own groups and were probably absorbed into others. If you are a PhD student or someone interested in statistics, I could see this being a great reference for exploring possible topics. From a non-technical perspective, I don't think it would be as interesting because so many of these topics require a lot of background information, so they just look like a bunch of fancy names. I was always a fan of the map of videos made by the channel Domain of Science. I don't think he's made one on statistics yet, so this could be a good starting point. So these are the results for the first analysis, but this analysis doesn't tell you how these topics may have changed in importance over time. For their second analysis, the authors modify their model ever so slightly that it allows us to answer this question. Here's a rough sketch of the analysis they performed. The authors divide up the papers into roughly equal time periods. Then, they run the clustering analysis on each of these time periods and get the leading topics for each one. The number of leading topics in each period is not assumed to be the same across time. The authors adjust their model to try to predict how topics in one period will evolve into topics in the next period. They do say it's a semi-supervised problem, but to be honest, the details here are a little bit above my head. The key takeaway though is that the analysis that the authors run allows them to identify the leading topics and how they change over time, and this is what they call dynamic clustering. 
Let's have a look at the results. In figure 5, the authors lay out the main topics by time period and add links to describe how they've changed over time. The first thing that stood out to me is that most of the leading topics of 1970 to 1979 are what a graduate student in statistics or biostatistics might learn. These were the classical topics that ended up with large clusters in the first analysis. These topics were important back then, and they keep their relevance going into the present day. The second thing I want to point out in the dynamic clustering is that we can start to see the rise of statistical topics associated with computational power, such as the bootstrap, mixed effect models, and spatial analysis. With more computation, statistical models were able to handle bigger and bigger data sets, and we started to need methods that let us learn from them. In the 2000s, we see the rise of topics like variable selection and dimension reduction. Much like this paper, we start seeing clustering in classification papers. I always assumed that clustering and classification were popular topics back then, but this analysis tells me they only became popular in recent times. Finally, we can use this graph to see how topics change. We can see that topics like data transformations and survival analysis only have one time in the spotlight. This was a little surprising to me because I feel like I get exposed to survival analysis a lot more, since it's a major biostatistics topic. I'm glad that I could finally get this video out of my system. I know that most people won't have any knowledge about many of the groups that come up in this video. There's even a few that I don't know about and I do this for a living. Like with the 8 innovations video, the goal of this video is to break a misconception that I feel most people have about statistics. That it's a static field that just finishes after you learn about the t-test and linear regression. But like any other field, statistics is alive and growing. Ideas are born and have their time in the limelight, and some might actually die. But statistics enables us to learn from all kinds of data. As technology improves, data can change, so statistics needs to change in response to that. When I read articles, I always try to explain enough to pique interest, but not enough to explain away the whole article. You can read this article online for free on Archive, and you can find a link in the description. If you'd like to get my videos straight to your inbox and get some extra content, like how I handle my video making process, or the tools I use, consider subscribing to the Very Normal Newsletter. Thanks again for your viewership. I'll see you in the next one.